1987, we traveled nearly the entire length of Vietnam, from Hanoi in the north to Saigon, now called Ho Chi Minh City, in the south, all the time looking for traditional hand paper making. We already knew from an old French journal that hand paper making had flourished in two villages near Hanoi, Yen Tai and Long Bui. And Dard Hunter, the famous paper historian, actually visited these villages in 1934 and wrote a wonderful little book about his experiences there. In 1987, we discovered that the paper makers of these villages were now organized into one collective unit, the Dong Hoa Collective. In the foreground, you can see paper drying there on the grass. There were three parts to this paper making unit. In one area, waste paper was recycled and made into new paper used for sanitary purposes, wrappings, and funeral objects. In the second section, the, the traditional Zor fiber, a bark fiber, usually mulberry, was used to make a fine paper for printmaking and other artwork. And a third part of the factory contained a paper machine, a small fujunaire. Here we see a cart of mulberry fiber on its way into the factory. Within the factory grounds, we saw the cooking unit where the mulberry fiber was cooked in lime for several hours. We saw this worker washing the cooked fiber, and as she transfers it to another tank, she pulls off some dark outer bark that still clings to the fiber. The next step is beating the fiber, and the Dong Hoa Collective had a large Hollander beater, which they used both for the Zor paper and for the recycled paper. If you look on the right, you can see the scraps of the recycled paper there in the foreground. These workers are forming sheets of the Zor paper. They use a mold, which is a wood frame with a bamboo screen held down by a U-shaped deco. Each sheet is couched right on top of each other. There are no separators used. The press used in the Zor paper making was an extremely simple device. We see the post of papers sandwiched between two boards. The long beam acts as a lever. It's weighed down with large stones. The other end fits into a hole in the wood structure of the press. The weight of the stones pulls the vertical beam down on the paper, thereby, thereby pressing out the water. Finally, the damp sheets of paper are hung on rods to dry in the sun. In another part of the factory, women were making recycled paper. The molds are different. A wood frame is covered by a piece of woven screening. There is no decal. To form a sheet, the paper maker makes one quick dip into the pulp, and then she couches the sheet onto a thin piece of cotton fabric. Here's a good view of the flat screen over there on the left and the separators between the cooch sheets. Then the poster of papers is pressed. Here the workers are using a large hand-operated screw press to press out the water. This woman is separating the pressed sheets, placing them on wood rods, and now these sheets are put outside to dry in the sun. We have returned to Hanoi 
in the year 2000, tremendous changes have occurred. The collectives have been dismantled. We see some sad reminders of the past war. But private enterprise is flourishing. The city is lively, bustling, and thriving. It seems everyone is roaring around on a motorcycle. We went back to the area of Long Bui and Yen Tai and managed to find some paper makers who had started up again with individual workshops. We met Mr. Van Landuk, whom we see here, working at his beta. He makes paper from recycled paper, but tells us that formerly he made special papers from zoar fiber. But now there is little demand. We see his paper press here, which he operates manually with a hydraulic car jack. The process of making the recycled paper here is exactly the same as we had witnessed at the Donghoa Collective 13 years previously. The paper maker is Mr. Van Duk's daughter-in-law, and she uses a flat wove screen, no deco, and cooches each sheet onto a thin cotton cloth. The sheet formation is just a quick dip into the pulp. And that's all. The preaching of the sheets seems to be a two-person affair. The elderly mother of Mr. Van Duk helps out with the preaching. And it is her job later to separate the pressed paper and place it on rods for drying. The final drying is done inside the house on these racks. We continued to interview Mr. Van Duk and we learned a little more about him and his history. At one time, a long time ago, did they yeah. make this paper in bigger sizes? Yeah. Always the same size. Long time ago. Yeah. Now he hope that some uh, one will come here book here. Nếu có người dùng thì tôi làm, không có người dùng thì không làm được. Không có người dùng không làm. Is that no one book this one? So he have to. So we change. Yes. Does he come from a long family of making paper? Have they? I mean, how many generations has he made? Has this family been making paper? Ba cho hỏi một chút là gia đình mình làm giấy bao lâu rồi? Ôi từ đời ông đời cha. Thế ạ, từ đời đến đây đến như đến như bác là bao lâu rồi? Có thế hàng mấy chục đời này? Thế ạ, từ ngày xưa nó lắm rồi. Từ thời xa xưa cách đây hàng mấy trăm năm là các cụ đã làm rồi. Yeah. Oh, he means that from it's been from few hundred years ago he ancestors started to make this one and handle down the the traditional trade and he still keep it making it. If you regret that now the society they have no need of using this one so he have to he had to delay it. Yes. Now he produces his paper with his recycle. Yes. We left Mr. Van Duk's workshop and walked again through the old section of Hanoi, searching for more paper makers. And we were successful. We found another producer of recycled paper. This is Nguyen Tinyuk. See the junk paper in the foreground there. Behind is the tank that holds the beaten pulp. The workshop here was far more spacious than Mr. Van Duk's and we had a better view of the processes. Mrs. Nugok had two young employees working at the vats. The molds and the sheet formation were just the same as we had seen at the previous workshop. Just one quick dip of the mold into the pulp and then it's pooched on the thin fabric sheet.
Here's the post of papers waiting to go into the press. They use here a hand-operated screw press. The next step is to put the pressed paper onto rods. Paper tears easily, but uh, it doesn't matter. She patches it up a little bit and uh, it's okay. Now the damp paper is put on racks outside and dries in the sun. They're asking me something. We drove north of Hanoi and took a ferry across the Red River to the province of Bac Ninh. The day before, we had bought some original prints on handmade Zor paper at an art shop in Hanoi. The shop owner told us the prints and paper were made in the village of Dong Kao. We walked through the village of Dong Kao looking for the workshop of Mr. Nguyen Van Buur, where Zor paper was made. We all had also learned that up to 1990, nearly the whole village was involved in making paper. Now only two families were left. We located the workshop of Mr. Van Buur and saw a whole group of lively young women forming sheets of Zor paper. Outside, we also saw the pit where the fiber is soaked in lime for 12 hours before cooking. See, on the right there, you see the empty lime bags. Product become unsellable. Oh, became unsellable. Yeah. That's why now just one or two families do mm -hmm. like make it on. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. That's why yeah. the uh, craft village like it declines. Yeah. Yeah. And here's the cooking unit a 55-gallon drum in which the fiber is cooked for 10 hours. The young man here is taking off the black bark, preparing the fiber for the cooking pot. The bark fiber varies in width and length, so he's adjusting the size of the pieces so that it will all cook evenly. Over on the right is a basket right in the pond there that contains shavings from the bark of a local tree called gal knot. This will produce a very useful formation aid. In another area of the workshop, we saw these women removing the remains of the black bark after the cooking process. Do they use the black bark for anything? Oh, cái nền này mình có dùng làm gì không ạ? Cái này xong mình uh, mình bán cho những người người ta làm về xấu. À, ah, if that in this place <coughs> he only produce the high quality paper, yeah. the get inside. And the ugly one like this, ugly material, he sell it to another person. They put something in the water when they cook it. Anh có cho thêm hóa chất gì vào trong cái nước khi luộc không ạ? Chỉ cho thêm vôi thôi. Vôi thì vôi tăng. Only quick lime stone. Right. Quick okay. lime stone. Yes. Yeah. Vôi để tăng độ nóng mà. Now here's the beater that the workshop uses to beat the fiber to a pulp. When the beating is finished, the pulp drains through the hole at the bottom edge there and is collected in the concrete vat, now ready for use. There were seven young women working at sheep farming. The girl at the back is literally stirring the pulp to keep it in suspension. She does this routinely after adding either more pulp or more formation aid. In front of each vat is a container of formation aid, the stuff that we have seen in the basket in the pond. The strips are simply soaked in water and a mucilaginous liquid is produced. This thick liquid is mixed with the pulp in the vat and helps to disperse the pulp on the screen, producing even, consistent sheets of paper. You can clearly see the details of those molds. The molds they use are the same we had seen in 1987 for the making of Zor paper.
The mold is a wood frame which supports a bamboo screen, and the roof deckle holds the screen in place. To form the sheet, the paper maker dips the mold in the pulp, does a shake shake, then disperses the pulp over the screen and throws out the excess pulp. She repeats that process a second time and then features the sheet. Watch her closely. Toward her, shake, shake, throw off the excess. Another dip, shake, shake, throws off the excess. Then she rests the mold for a second on the surface of the back. I think this helps to release the paper from the bamboo screen. In the kitchen, each sheet is placed right on top of each other on the post. There are no separating sheets. To make thicker sheets, the mold can be dipped again and again into the pulp, building up more layers to the desired thickness. Each worker here makes about 1,000 sheets of paper in a day. And these women are paid for the number of hours that they work. Next, the post of papers goes into the press. The press is a manually operated screw press. And see how slowly the worker is applying pressure. The slow pressure prevents the papers from sticking to each other. And the pressing is done over a time period of 30 minutes. In this room, we see one girl <laughs> carefully separating the damp sheets of paper. As she takes off the sheet from the pile, she reverses it and sets it down in another stack. That whole stack will, will be left to dry. Here too, if she gets a little tear in the paper, she just fixes it and there's no problem. She puts it right back on the pile. The woman on the right is working on a block of papers that is already dry. She is separating each dry sheet and making another pile. In this room, the finished paper is being sorted and packaged for sale. All of the paper made here is quite special. It's sold for woodblock printing and painting, uh, for the wrapping of ceramics that are shipped overseas. It's used to line the backs of paintings because it's for moisture and insects. It's also used in books of special Chinese and Vietnamese writings. And gold beaters use it as a substrate in the beading of gold leaf. I asked three times how the white paper was achieved, but I never had a real answer. We are leaving the Dong Kao workshop now, returning to Hanoi with a bundle of beautiful paper, plus a papermaking mold. Back in Hanoi, we walk through the marketplaces to see what kinds of paper are being sold. We are on a street called Pho Hong Jai which means paper street in Vietnamese. 
At one time, we were told, nearly every shop on this street sold paper. Now we found only a few. We approached one store where we saw bundles of paper. Unfortunately, the machine made from recycled paper. But this shop is more interesting. It featured funeral objects made of paper, meant to be burned at burials. There's a television set and a VCR, a, a thermos bottle and dishes. There's even a bicycle. Everything that might be needed by the deceased in the next world. This young girl is busy producing paper money that also will be burned. She's brushing gold paint onto sheets of paper that have a square of silver foil on them. It's gold money for the afterworld. Formerly, handmade paper was used for this, and, it's, and it still is in China and Myanmar. But here in Hanoi, the handmade has been largely replaced by machine products. In 1987, as we traveled south from Hanoi, we passed many Chan ruins of religious monuments. But there are still Chan people living in central Vietnam, and friends have told us that they do make paper there by hand. We had one more papermaking experience to relate. In 1987, we ran into a small group of Americans who had served in the Vietnam War and now had returned to visit. They were the only Americans we met that year. When they heard that we were researching hand paper making, they told us that we would see a lot of rice paper drying by the roadside. And this is what we did see often on the long road south to Ho Chi Minh City. These round objects were called by the Vietnamese guides rice paper, but it's a misnomer. They are not paper at all. They are thin cakes of rice flour that are used by the Vietnamese as wrappers to make delicious spring rolls. So ended our paper research, and along the way, we made some new friends. <laughs>